I know we're a bit short on time, so uh, I'm going to get going. And um, so we've had the good news this morning that there's stronger evidence than ever that advertising and marketing are making a powerful and profound contribution to the UK economy. The bad news is there are still plenty of critics of the industry eager to knock us and this success, and in many ways, certainly when referring to the ad industry, to paint us as the poster boys of everything that is wrong with capitalism. Some of this bad publicity is in the hope that we'll get more restrictions, and some, I think, would actually like to see an end to marketing communications entirely. And these voices have become increasingly shrill and aggressive. Only this week in The Guardian, dare I say, Gary Young bemoaned a popular culture rife with deception, from Beyonce lip-syncing at Obama's inauguration to horse meat in supermarket burgers and Lance Armstrong doping his way to medal glory. These are all apparently, according to Gary Young, the result of a culture where trust has been eroded by marketing. Advertising is accused of fueling excessive consumerism, rampant environmental damage, and creating a moral vacuum. There's no reason we shouldn't pause and consider the morality of what we do, but we should do this with a sense of proportion. Too much of this debate has been in a vacuum. It's good to get a chance to debate this one-on-one, -on -one because actually, in many cases, the different parts of the argument are just standing in different places, casting rocks at each other. And sadly, like a lot of generalist arguments, the industry's critics try to demonize their enemy. They represent an absolutist case with the conviction of a sixth-form debating society. You know the kind of generalist arguments. All big business is bad. All politicians are deceitful. All immigration should be stopped. The generalist rejection of advertising and marketing as a bad thing is equally simplistic. Not that Giles will do anything as blunt as that. Of course I will. Brace yourselves. <laughs> Brace yourselves for a compelling and doubtless devastating critique of the industry. But before we hear from him, let's hear the case for the defense. I have 10 simple points to make. So let's cut straight to the chase. Simple point number one, why it's better to have advertising than to ban it. Because having better things cheaper is a good thing. Advertising is merely the final stage of a thriving creative economy. People have great ideas for products. They're developed, they're perfected, they're advertised. People notice them, they buy them. Someone then notices, they can make one better. They develop it, they perfect it. Then there's advertising when it needs to be communicated. Then someone notices they can make that product cheaper or in a more environmentally friendly way. That's communicated and things improve. Ultimately, the person with the best proposition and the best price wins through. And this is the modest, virtuous circle of value that we inhabit. The result, better things, cheaper. In fact, a study by the US Federal Trade Commission showed a comparison between US states that allowed the advertising of optician services with ones that didn't. And to show the value of that marketing communication, in the states where you were allowed to advertise, prices were on average 25% cheaper, allowing more people more access to, to eye care. My simple point number two, people are intelligent. Inform them and let them decide. We live in a modern, open, highly informed society. Largely it works on the basis that if you give people information, they can make their own minds up. But it's not an unfettered free-for-all. There are some things that are beyond the market. That's why we operate within an economy that's regulated. Harmful products and service, services are regulated out. Poor ones fail, and the strongest and most innovative thrive. The unpleasant truth at the heart of the argument to curtail advertising is actually a contempt for ordinary people. These people are not clever enough to make up their own minds. How dare they want stuff? They're gullible, shallow, unintelligent. They need to be protected from themselves. A vivid example, a paper published by George Monbiot and other left-leaning thinkers recently called Think of Me as Evil, concluded that the public was so vulnerable to advertising that posters should carry the following disclaimer. Warning. This advertisement may influence you in ways you are not consciously aware of. <laughs> Buying consumer goods is unlikely to improve your well-being, and borrowing to buy consumer goods may be unwise. Not only does this display a huge contempt for the audience, its main outcome is likely to be a sharp increase in road deaths, as people struggle to read the small print as they zoom <laughs> past the posters. That dismissive and arrogant attitude for audience has never been so wrong. The media landscape has changed so much 
and has left these ideas of an ignorant supine public behind. If you do bad advertising for a bad product, you won't just be found out. Social media will spread your failings like wildfire. Witness the recent Nokia camera phone campaign where an advert was pulled after viewers took to Twitter to complain that the product demo was fake. Or the Mary J. Blige Burger King campaign from the US that was swept off air after viewers were offended by what they saw as racism and took to Twitter in their thousands. Marketing communications are a valid and a vital component of a modern, thriving, democratic society. Good advertising for good products can thrive across social media, where audiences effectively regulate what they see. And, I'm sorry to say, if they like what they see, they will praise it, share it, and promote it. Simple point number three, Demo democratic society is all about choice. And the freedom to choose works on a number of le levels. If we imagine a ladder of choice, there are profound and important choices at the top. Our democratic right to choose the way we are governed, our social rights to express our identity, our sexuality, our spiritual rights to follow our beliefs and our forms of worship. And somewhere on that ladder, perhaps not right at the top in the most profound way, but somewhere on the ladder is our right to choose how we live our lives, what we consume, what we spend our money on, what we wear, eat, drive, where we go on holiday. Point number four, and this may sound contradictory, is that democratic society isn't an a la carte menu. Okay? This, this ladder of choices, it's a set of principles that all rely on each other. They are interlinked and they reinforce and revitalize each other. One seamless principle that underpins not just the way we make a living or the way we choose to spend our earnings, it drives our entire socioeconomic system. For all of its faults and fallibilities, it's the best thing we've found so far. Simple point number five. Advertising isn't just about the right to choose, it fuels choice. From flights, mobile phones, retail services, the growth of broadband, there's a 76 billion pound business in online sales which is made possible through advertiser-funded search engines. Two thirds of newspaper revenues come from advertising, fueling debate, paying for free expression, and making it affordable and accessible to more and more people. Simple point number six, as an industry, we are not rabid growth junkies. Most of the people in this room do not busy themselves by thinking, how will I grow the economy? How will I use more resources up? How will I get more people to buy things they don't need? Most people in this room do their jobs in fiercely competitive markets. They are preoccupied with holding or growing their share of their market. That is why so much of what we are concerned with is shifting preference and doing this by creating brilliant products, continually perfecting them, and then communicating their strong points of difference. Whether it's the marketing battles between BA and Virgin, Mac and PC, Virgin Media and Sky, this isn't advertising as a blunt and relentless driver of growth, but advertising as a redistributor of consumption from average or bad products and services to better ones. Simple point number seven. Right, I'm okay for time. Yep. So, um, simple point number seven, the ad industry is not some evil monolith. The demonic picture painted by the ad industry's detractors that we are somehow all conspiring to manipulate the minds of hapless consumers is to totally misunderstand the nature of our industry. I am always astonished by how anti-establishment and anti-authoritarian so many people who naturally gravitate towards the industry are. Also, the fact that we're, it's an industry populated by so many people who are questioning, socially aware, liberal, and very, very opinionated. They want to exercise their right to choose quite often and, and to choose what they work on. Chief executive beware, if you come back to your agency with a brief for cigarettes, genetically modified food, the wrong political party, certain media organizations, that multinational company whose interests extend into arms manufacturing, or even toys, you could get short shrift from the people within your agency refusing to work on it. Simple point number eight. The truth is, we are all about telling the truth and telling it well. The majority of people in marketing and advertising would find it hard to motivate themselves if they didn't believe that what they were selling is beneficial to the lives of the people they're talking to. Bob Levinson, the legendary DDB copywriter, was strident on the subject. If we play tricks with the truth, we die. We will die in our marketplace, on our shelves, in our gleaming packages of empty promises. But telling the truth about a product demands a product that is worth telling the truth of. Simple point number nine. 
Advertising builds brands and brands are accountable. Amongst all of the noise and clutter and energy of society and the communications market, brands provide a reference point for consumers. Brand, brands make promises and commitments in their marketing that makes them accountable to consumers. And simple point number 10, we are accused of selling people things they don't need. Let's hear it for things that we don't need. YNR posted a statement on their blog recently praising advertising's ability to inspire you to get things you don't actually need. Beyond water and some basic foodstuffs and a bit of shelter, we obviously don't need much else, but there's plenty of other things in life that bring us joy, they bring texture to life, they give us experience, and they inspire us. Music, fashion, film, uh, cars, holidays, etc. And a little inspiration is a good thing. In fact, many people are inspired by organized religion and issues of the spirit as well. I could go on. I could go on about all of the vital public information that is, is disseminated through marketing and advertising. The winter flu campaigns, the computer literacy advice, the awareness on teenage pregnancy, and avoiding becoming a victim of crime. I could go on about the vast and vital work done by agencies for charities, much of it voluntary. Let's not forget everyone from Oxfam to the NSPCC, Greenpeace and Amnesty use advertising and marketing as a vital part of their armory. I could go on, but I won't. All I would say, in conclusion, is that there are some great recent examples that show the power of good advertising for good products that were picked up by good purposes for good people. One of our clients is John Lewis. It's a business with strong values and a strong point of difference and a genuinely compelling offer for people. It has commissioned strong advertising that has proved a big hit, not just on television, but has traveled very widely on social media. Perhaps the biggest testament to a good story told well was when the long wait, last Christmas's Christmas commercial, the one about the little boy who can't wait to give a present rather than to receive one at, at Christmas, was picked up in church sermons across the country. It also became an official subject of school assemblies. The official assembly guide was downloaded by over 7,000 schools and used in front of over 1 million children. Who would have thought that this industry could sell that most Christian of advertising messages, that it is better to give than receive? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Look, what do I know? I'm a vicar, OK? Uh, this is not my game. I'm here to play a pantomime villain, Lear's fool, whatever you like, but to be provocative. And I'd like to start my provocation by thinking a little bit about the language of growth. In 1928, the great economist John Maynard Keynes gave this lecture. He went back to his uh, old University of Cambridge, and he gave this lecture called The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. It became a very famous lecture. And the reason Keynes gave this lecture, and it's unlike anything that he, he gave before or after, is that he was terribly worried about the rise of communism and that a lot of young men and women at, at universities were beginning to feel attracted to communism as a new creed, as an ideal, that it had a utopian project. So he wanted to articulate the utopianism of capitalism. What made capitalism so brilliant? And his argument was this, is that capitalism is a means to an end. And the end is, and it was quite extraordinary how he finishes his lecture, his end was a form of bliss. He talks about people in slightly religious language returning back to the garden where they don't have to work very much, where they're wealthy enough. And all is sort of the lilies, he even talks about the lilies of the field. When we're wealthy enough, this will be our state, this state of bliss. And he made two predictions in 1928. He said, in 100 years' time, uh, our standard of living will have grown by between four and eight times. And because our standard of living will have grown by four and eight times, second prediction, we will have to work less and less and less and less. And in 100 years' time, we will work three hours a day. The interesting thing about the two predictions is the one about growth he was roughly right about. Even though there was a, another world war to come, is that actually, in 70 years' time, standard living had actually quadrupled, had gone up four times. And if you look at the chart, it is about, uh, the growth in this country is about exactly what he anticipated. 
Have we worked less? Not a bit. We've worked more. He got the growth bit right, but we're absolutely no nearer to Eden whatsoever. No nearer to that idyllic utopia that he imagined in 1928. Why is this? Because Keynes did not make a distinction between needs and wants. He thought they were the same thing. He thought when we had our basic needs met, our basic needs for food, shelter, warmth, those basic things of life, when we've got those things met, then all will be well. That those things, those needs, were satiable. And that growth would reach a point where, once we've met all our needs, all will be well. We'll sit in the garden, and we'll enjoy our utopia, and we'll enjoy each other. Wants, however, are different to needs. And wants are intrinsically insatiable. I can want the most extraordinary things, or be made to want the most extraordinary things. I can be meant, made to want uh, an example in uh, the Skidelsky book uh, recently, How Much is Enough, um, uh, is, is about some tent that I can sit in my garden that costs £10,000, and I can sit in my garden to drink my tea with because it's a nice green colour. You can be made to want the tent. Wants and needs are different. Here's where advertising comes in. I'm sitting in my garden the other day. An OK day, playing a bit of football with my kids. Got all right, got enough, what I want. I go and sit down in my jeans and T-shirt, watch the telly, and then it starts. The message is this. You know this life you've got now? You've got enough. You're playing football with your kids, you're in your jeans and your T-shirts, but actually, it's just a bit shit. It's shit because it's not enough. Because you could be thinner or younger or have a flashier car or you could have more. There is no such thing as enough. The government loves this message because it wants to tell us about growth, growth, growth. But growth makes us miserable. That desire constantly to have more and more and more and more. There is a difference between wants and needs. The great philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche, who I did my PhD on, um, has this fantastic criticism of Christianity. I think it's the most devastating cr criticism of Christianity there is. He said, Christianity comes along as the healer. But in order to heal, the first thing it subtly does is it has to create the wound. So what Christianity does, says Nietzsche, is it goes, you think your life is fine. The first thing I have to do is tell you that your life is rubbish and then show you how you can be saved from your rubbish life. It wounds you, and then it presents itself as the healer. And my contention is bad advertising, not all advertising, but bad advertising can make society so much more miserable by starting to wound and then present Westfield Shopping Centre as the healer. That's the new religion. That's the new temple of religion where we are healed. We are healed from our pain. And Keynes was sort of right. He was right that there was going to be great growth, and he was completely wrong that this would always lead us to Eden unless we make a distinction between what we need and what we want. We will always be on a treadmill forever trying to grow and grow and grow. And that will never make us happy. And the tip of the spear, the tip of that spear of growth, is the people sitting in this room. Thank you very much. So in the, in the spirit of debate, um, <laughs> I would, I'd like to, um, to put one point to you, Giles, which is um, you talk about wants are insatiable, okay? And again, I'd have to say that feels like a massive generalization. The idea that we are all afflicted with wants that are insatiable. I think there are some people who have limitless wants, and there are other people who have very, very finite ones. And I think to ascribe that same insatiability to everyone is, again, that broad brushstroke You're such generalism. a nice chap. 
But I, I got, to, I think, if you look deep down, you can always be, you can always want more and have more and be made to feel that you want more. I, I, my wants are completely insatiable, and, you, and mm. our fantasies. I mean, the one thing that that Freud would talk about, about, about our fantasies and, and our mm. desires, that our desires can never be met. And, well, I, hang on a second, people can't hear your question, so that's quite complicated, so we're talking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and your desire for an answer can be met afterwards. <laughs> so there is, a, there, is a, there is a question about whether you can, whether yeah. the, the, there is something dangerous about mm. playing with your desires, generating, mm. Uh, intensifying your desire, yep. and that's part of what you're doing. Well, I think the point, and the point that David was trying to make from the floor <laughs> was the uh, why does advertising make you, you know, if you want more, you want more already. So you've, in the, to go back to Nietzsche, you've wounded yourself already. You're not being wounded by. No, no, no. I mean, I can be made to want things that I don't want now. I mean, that's that's definitely true. I never knew that I wanted X, but suddenly when you show me X on the screen. And you put it in such a plausible way, mm. which you have a way with words. You'll be, you'll be <coughs> fantastic at doing that. I go, do you know, I never thought I wanted that, but actually, I sort of do. Mm. But, OK, I think it's not just a question of more, though. It's this idea that we have a choice between not, not indulging this, not wanting more. And actually, it's not just more. It can be about better. And actually, a lot of the people who are developing products and services and selling them are actually very, very committed to the idea that they're making products and services that are better than the ones that precede them. That's good. So it's not very about good. volume. It's about the qualitative value that those things have. And in some senses, that will make people's lives better. It may save them time, may allow them more time with their family. And so it's not just about volume. It can be a qualitative improvement. That's, of course, that's, that's a very sensible answer. And there's a large extent to which that's right. But you see, you look at this, you look at this problem about what Keynes said, and, and, and um, this whole idea that we're going to grow continually. All politicians believe in this. I mean, you know, the Labour Party. Do you remember that nasty 1997 Labour Party campaign with that D Ream song? What was that D Ream? Was it the, low, the only way is up, or things can only get better, or whatever it was? Do you remember that irritating song that was? And the idea that we're always on this constant growth pattern, always going up, always. Always, always wanting more and more and more. I mean, it's, and they end up like a Melda Marcos with 500 pairs of shoes. I mean, I can't understand how 501 pairs of shoes, but someone can make her want 501 pairs of shoes in the name of growth. And I think this growth stuff is actually a rather dangerous agenda mm. if it's not chastened by a sense of what would enough look like. We need to have a sense of what enough looks like. It's actually a very, very subversive message when, you know, I mean, um, Gavin, and the front of your welcome you've got here, you've got in politics, as in business, growth is the name of the game. Well, it, th that's, it, you're right. I mean, in politics and in business, growth is the name of the game, constantly. But that is a problem because the, there has to be a sense in which sit back and go, I have enough. But I think every, each individual's enough is different. And I don't think it is the... And even I don't believe that you, as a member of an organised religion, believe that you can sit there and say, there is a level of enough that should apply to everyone. No, no, no. So uh, I'm not seeking a return... So if we were actually talking about... Um, either we have communism or we have this particular sort of capitalism. I want capitalism... 2.0, as it were. I want the new version of capitalism. And the new version of capitalism has prosperity in it, but actually it's a prosperity that's not making us unhappy. Because if you look at happiness levels and growth, they do not correlate either. Mm. Actually, we are growing and growing and growing. We're, 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 we're being uh, made to want all sorts of different things that we don't think we need. And actually, we're comparing ourselves to other people, and it doesn't make us happy. That's the problem. There's something fundamental about our, our spiritual health as a society that is actually damaged by this, this constant demand for growth. And the, the other thing about growth, if I just say one more mm. thing, um, is that the question is growth for whom? I'm going right now from here to Tower Hamlets. And uh, I'm chairing a meeting in Canary, Canary Wharf with the business community in Canary Wharf. And I'm the chair of this thing called the Fairness Commission in Tower Hamlets. And I want to give you two statistics about Tower Hamlets that I think are absolutely extraordinary. 
One is, Tower Hamlets is the highest child poverty in the country. 52% of children who live in Tower Hamlets live in child poverty. And, question, what is the average wage of the people who work in Tower Hamlets? Who work in Tower Hamlets? The average age. Now, I've tested this out on tons and tons of people, and I can't do it with you here. It's £80,000 a year, the average age of the people who work in Tower Hamlets. Why? Because of Canary Wharf. That is such a spectacularly unfair society. That's what growth looks like for many. If you're sitting in Poplar, when you've got five kids in a bedroom, and you're suffering from the government's cuts and austerity, to bring growth to other people in places like Canary Wharf. You really ask yourself, growth for whom? And then you turn on the television and you're being sold things you can't afford. I'm sorry, it's a problem. I think that we probably, perhaps we differ in our definitions of growth and certainly virtuous growth. When it comes to Canary Wharf, I think that's banking, not advertising, personally. But the, uh, the, it's probably time for us you, to draw they? close to it, isn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>